Let's see what we can do here. Got the microphone in the frame. All right, we're live. I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com, and today we are going to find out if you are learning English words the wrong way. Now, I suppose there are many ways to learn English, so there could actually be many wrong ways to learn, but really there's actually just one good one that's going to help you speak. All right, well, let's see if we get some people in here. I want to keep this video shorter. I actually don't have a lot of time. I'll do my best to get right to the point, and then if people have questions, I can stay a little bit after and answer some of those. Uh, but hopefully, people enjoy this. So you can let me know where you're from or if you have any questions, but again, want to keep this video short. The first one here, you can say, I am the first one here, or the first one to be here. You could say that. All right, so why am I making this video and why do I, I think there is a wrong way to learn English? All right, well, the first thing is that if you want to become a fluent speaker, which is probably your goal, you don't want to just learn more vocabulary but not be able to communicate. Uh, so if you want to learn, there is really a specific way you should learn the language that helps you speak, and there are other ways of learning the language that will teach you more but stop you from speaking. So the reason I wanted to make this video uh, is I saw on Instagram, it was a really interesting, interesting in kind of a bad way, but this is a, it was an interesting video uh, about learning English. It was like an, uh, it was a quiz. So very quickly, it wasn't really teaching anything. This was just a quick quiz for prepositions. So prepositions are things like in, on, above, and below. So places where something might happen, a preposition. Uh, so it, it was just a very quick video that was giving a quiz as one example. Uh, the, we'll, we'll just have the word thankful. So is it thankful to or thankful for? So this was just a quiz. It just said thankful. Thankful to or thankful for? And then it just gave an answer. The correct answer is thankful to, and then we'll move on to the next thing. So the next one was something like married. I don't remember if these are the exact examples, but. So what do we say? We say married to or married for, which is the correct answer. Married to or married for. And it's just like, all right, well, it just said the correct answer is for. All right, so there's no explanation, no, no anything about this. It just gives the word, and then it's giving you two options, which of those is correct, all right? Uh, the third one was worried. I think you get the idea. Uh, so let's see, we could be worried, uh, let's see, worried for uh, or worried uh, about. Are you worried for something or worried about something? All right, and then it just says, uh, we'll be worried about. All right, so that was the whole quiz. It was a very quick, very short internet uh, or Instagram video. Uh, it said thankful, and then it gave you two options, married, and then two options, and worried, and then it gave you two options. The problem with this is that both of these options can be correct for all of these, okay? All right, so we have thankful to and thankful for, uh, married to and married for and worried for uh, and worried about. I'll let this uh, ambulance pass by us for a moment. Uh, so why do I say this is the wrong way? This, like the whole idea of this video uh, is that if you're trying to teach someone, okay, do we use two or four with the word thank, thankful uh, or two or four with the word married or for or about or anything else? There could even be other words that we use. But natives don't think about the word this way, all right? So when I talk about people learning the language the wrong way, what I say is they're beginning with the word by itself rather than the situation, all right? Now, I want to make this clear. Hopefully, it should be an easy-to-understand idea. Uh, but let's see if, like, we'll, we'll make sure people understand what's, what's happening with this, all right? So usually what students are doing, I'll make this... Uh, clear up here. Okay, we have this. So there is the English as a second language way of learning the language, and then there's English as a first language, the way of learning the language. So usually what students in ESL do is they will begin with a word, 
So it could be anything, like a word in their native language, or they're trying to remember a word in English, and then they will get just a, a definition of that word. So we begin with a word in English, or a word in their, uh, like the translation of that, and then you will get a definition or translation of that word in English. So students are trying to learn these words, they're not trying to understand situations. And this is why they have trouble communicating. They're trying to think about, okay, well, is it thankful to or thankful for? It could be both. It could be either. It depends on the situation. Okay, so I'll give you a few examples of these, but I just want to make it clear these are two different ways of learning. If you do the ESL way where you're trying to learn things and translate them in your head, you are going to be translating in your head when you speak. It's going to stop you from communicating fluently. But if you learn as a, as a first language, so you're learning English the same way you learn new things every day in your native language, and that's how you become a fluent speaker. There's nothing stopping you. There are no translations that are causing you to think and hesitate. Uh, and so what we're doing here is we're not beginning with a word. We're beginning with a situation. So I'll just put an S here for situation. And then we learn the vocabulary. Okay? All right, I'll go back and answer questions in just a moment. But let me give you some examples of this. <clears throat> All right, so let's say we're thankful. We begin with a situation about, like, being thankful. We're not starting with the preposition. We're beginning with the situation of being thankful. So I could be thankful to you. I'm very thankful to you. I'm like directing my thanks at you. So I'm thankful, for, I'm thankful uh, to you for helping me, something like that, okay? So I'm thankful to my mother for raising me. I'm thankful to my mother for raising me. All right. I'm not worried about the preposition. I'm worried about this over here. I'm thinking about this. All right. Again, I'm beginning with the situation, not the vocabulary. The vocabulary comes second. The situation comes first. Okay. Now, hopefully, uh, this is this is very important. I hopefully hopefully I'm making this clear. Uh, I just wanted to make this video clear uh, quickly because I saw that that post and I said, why is so somebody is making that content and then somebody else, like an English learner, is like, oh, okay, I guess the answer is thankful too. But wait a minute, you could be thankful for something else. I'm thankful for like the lovely home I have or I'm thankful for my good health, all right? So I could be even thankful to someone for what they did for me. So I could be thank you, I could be thankful to you, I, like I could be thankful uh, to you for watching me. All right. So thanks for watching, thanks for watching. But I'm thankful to you. Okay. So again, we're beginning with the situation of like of being thankful. So who are we thanking, or what are we thankful about? What are we thankful for? All right. So we don't begin with a word like two or four, and then and then try to attach it to thankful. Do we always say? Thankful to? No, we don't say that. It depends on the situation. So as you learn like a native, you begin with the word thankful, and then you think, when might a native speaker use this? When is a person thankful? Okay, so we begin with maybe someone did something nice for me. Oh, thank you. So I'm thankful to that person. Or I'm thankful for the thing that they did for me. So I'm thankful for you watching this video. Or I'm thankful to you, okay? So I could also say thanks, thanks to you, or thanks for watching this, same thing, okay? But as you're, again, getting these examples of these things, I want you to think more because if you ask a native speaker, when do we use the word to? They will really have trouble answering that because there really are many different ways we might use that. And a native speaker will always be thinking about like specific situations. Now, a teacher might say, oh, okay, here are the like five different uses of two <laughs> or something like that, all right? I'm not, I'm not telling you there are five uses of two. I don't want you to remember any rule like that. I really want you to understand we begin with the situation rather than the vocabulary. So to learn the language the right way, and by right way, I mean in a way that will help you speak, this is how you learn it, all right? Let's go to the next example. So married, all right? Maybe you can figure this one out, I bet, after I did the first one. Could you be married to? Can you think of an example for that? Or could you be married for? I'll take a, just give you a second here to see if you can put these, if you could write a sentence for either one where you could use these. Because if you ask a native speaker, this is how they will be thinking. 
they'll be thinking, huh, married to or married for, hmm, which one would be correct? So again, in this situation, it depends. The situation determines the use of the vocabulary, all right? So we always begin with the situation. The situation is more important than the vocabulary, all right? Our speaking, Salima says, are prepositions a big problem for speaking correctly if you don't use them correctly? Or, Well, yeah, really any vocabulary, if you don't know it very well, you won't feel confident using it. The real reason most people don't speak fluently is because they just don't feel confident and sure about the vocabulary they have. So when they see a quiz like this, it's like, ooh, thankful to or thankful for, and they just get the answer like, well, the answer is thankful to. But when they get into a situation where you must use for, then people are going to be confused about that. Okay. All right. I didn't get any answers yet. I'll keep moving. So married. I could be married to my wife. I'm married to a person. I'm married to my wife. Okay. But I could be also married to my job. Have you ever heard that expression? To be married to your work. So someone who works a lot, they don't go home or spend time with their family or other, other people. Uh, they're married to their work. So I'm married to my job, all right? I'm married to my wife, and maybe I'm also married to my job. So I could be like spending all of my time with my wife, or I could be married to some other, you know, rich person or poor person or someone from a different country or whatever, married to that person. So natives are thinking about the idea of like directing that to someplace, okay? So remember, you could be married to someone. You could also be married to something. I'm married to the idea of something, all right? So in this case, I'm married to the idea of teaching people so they can actually use their English and communicate fluently, okay? Very good. So married for money. Someone could be married for money, or I could be married for 10 years. I could be talking about the duration, how long have I been married, okay? I could be married to someone, or I could be married for 10 years, or maybe you talk about the reason why they got married. I got married for security. I got married for security. Okay, so that's the reason why. So here we have like even four, we could talk about the duration, so how long, or we could talk about a reason why. All right, is it, is it, is it getting clear? Is everybody understanding this? All right, so I'm thankful to someone, or I'm thankful like about some situation. I'm really thankful like for, for this situation. You could say the same thing. All right, so I'm thankful for the rain. It's been very dry and my garden needs some water. So I'm thankful for the rain. Maybe I'm thankful to the rain gods who gave me the rain, okay? So married, I could be married to someone. I could be married to an idea, okay? All right, let's see some other examples. Uh, let's see, boring of or boring for? Well, what, what, what do you think? So th imagine like a situation, I'm bored. I'm like bored of this. Like maybe I'm tired of this lesson. I don't like this lesson anymore. Hopefully you are not bored of this lesson. All right. I'm bored of this lesson. Bored of, bored of. All right. Let's see. So word power made easy by Norman Lewis, what you say about this book. Uh, actually, I think, yeah, I got that many years ago. Like even native speakers will get things like that. So asking about that specific book. Again, I don't really recommend go people going through trying to memorize vocabulary. Again, that's beginning with the word rather than beginning with the situation. So if you want to speak fluently, it's much better to learn situations and then what we would say in that situation. As an example, I was meeting my, uh, my wife's uncle, yes, my wife's uncle. Uh, so we were having dinner at a, like a, just a local restaurant. And uh, at the end of the meal, so the situation is right at the end of the meal, what do you say when you ask for the check? So in Japanese, it's like, there are a couple different ways you could say that. You could say like, I'm finished, or you could say, check please. 
but I'm, I, can, I can listen if I don't know what that is. I understand the situation. Okay, the meal is finished. I'm now asking for my bill or for my check. And just like that in Japanese, I could say the same thing in English. I could say, check please, or could we have the check, or could we get the check, or could we have the bill? I might hear all of those different things when I'm meeting people, or if I go to a restaurant, I will hear those different people. They might, I might just hear, check please, check, can we get the check? So you will hear different people using that for that situation. This is why it's so important to learn vocabulary the right way. All right. So when we, when we think about what's a specific situation and then what might people use in that situation. Okay. Does that make sense? So when you learn the right way, you begin with a situation and I call it the right way because this is how we learn how to speak. Okay. So in, in your native language, you, when you were learning the language, you would begin with a situation or a word that usually like, like your mom said something like stop. You learn immediately, ah, the word stop is connected with that situation of I should not do something anymore. <laughs> All right. So if my like my my daughters are like banging on the wall in the house and maybe they're going to break something, I say, stop, don't do that. All right. And they understand like by my emotion or the way I'm describing something, they understand what I mean. OK, even if I just say blah, they would probably understand that like that means stop what they're doing. Okay. But again, the point is you begin with a situation rather than the vocabulary. Don't try to memorize a bunch of things like four and two and all these things. Like it's not going to help you speak. It's only going to make you more confused. All right. What you should do instead is think, oh, okay, when I'm being thankful, what do I say? Okay. All right. Let's look at the last one. Worried for or worried about. See if you can think like a native, because if I ask a native, what do you say? Do you say you're worried for or worried about? Do you say you're worried for something or worried about something? And a native would say, well, I could use either, I guess. I could use both of them. All right. See, I'll give you a second. I'm going to check comments, but see if people have any questions about that. But see if you can post just write a sentence. Just write a quick, a quick sentence. Try to use both of these worried for something or worried about something. All right, see what you got there. I'll go back and check, check comments as those are coming in. Uh, but I'm thankful for everybody joining me today. It's nice to see you guys. Thankful to you all joining me today. I could use both of those. Uh, let's see, we've got people from France, Indonesia, uh, in the United States via Serbia. Nice to see everyone there from Germany. Now living in Wisconsin? Ah, uh, Nils, yeah, there are actually a lot of Germans, uh, people with German heritage in Wisconsin. Uh, Julian is back, hi teacher, and people here, greetings from uh, Colombia. Rafa is back, hi, greetings from Venezuela. I admire your journey of inspiration. Uh, you have been creating a safe space for all of us here to be better and reach our potential. Yep, yeah, I'm glad to hear. So remember, uh, as, let's see here, uh, Rafa is saying, you don't have to be like putting yourself in uh, in a stressful situation to get fluent. You just have to understand English like a native, and this is how you do it. So after you understand, then you feel, ah, now I can communicate. Now I feel confident expressing myself. So you get fluent by understanding the language like a native, not by trying to repeat like the words two and four over and over again. Okay, happy two, happy two, happy four, which do I use? All right, all right, before I take a look at these, see if anyone else, let's see. Um, Okay, so am I worried for my exam uh, if this is correct or should I say worried about? So we'll begin with that one. So you could be worried. Usually if you have like an idea of something like I'm worried about, I'm thinking generally about something. So like I'm thinking about my test and now I'm worried about it. So just thinking generally, I, I don't even have a specific, you know, I, I don't know what might be wrong. I'm just generally worried about my particular test, so I'm worried about something. Uh, you will typically hear worried about more frequently. So if I'm worried about something, I could be worried about a person, like my daughter is traveling somewhere, I'm worried about her, uh, or I'm worried about, uh, I'm worried about what I might say if I, I don't know, say something, say the wrong thing. I'm worried about my English if I use the wrong thing. I'm worried about that, okay? 
but four is typically where you're you're kind of you're you're thinking about somebody else. All right. So like I'm I'm worried for my friend. So he has a problem and I'm kind of worried for him. I'm worried for maybe what, what might happen in his situation. So I don't know what will happen. So my friend, he's in the hospital right now. I'm really worried for him. So it means I'm, I'm showing empathy and kind of imagining I'm being in, in his situation. So I'm worried for him. I could also be worried about him if I'm thinking about him. But if I'm worried for him, it's like I can imagine myself in his situation. So he's in the hospital and he broke his leg and he has some other problems. So I'm worried for him. Okay. All right. Let's go back and see if anybody. So I'm worried about the upcoming interview, says Julian. Yes, that's correct. Uh, nice to see you again. Just coming back from my holiday. Jay from Indonesia. Nice to see you there. Abdallah, worried for not uh, understanding what the native speakers might say. Yeah, you could say worried about in this situation. So in this situation, I'm worried about not understanding, all right? But we do, the point of this exercise is that we do have times where we would say for, okay? So if I'm worried for you, I'm really worried for you. I'm worried for you. It's like in your, in your place. I imagine I am you. Uh, and, and then I, I can feel that worry. So maybe my friend is worried about something and I'm worried for him. <laughs> So I'm, I'm doing something like I'm kind of worried about, about what he will feel or if there's a problem, what will happen to him. So I'm worried for him, all right? But again, the, today is not to, to memorize what these words mean because they mean different things in different situations. So we begin with the situation, not the word. We don't try to memorize every preposition. We don't get a dictionary and say, okay, what are all of the prepositions I need to know in English? All right, that's the wrong way to learn the language if you want to speak. If you just need to pass a test where the teacher asks, give me, I don't know, 10 prepositions, then you will do fine on that test. But if you're in a real conversation where you have to speak, the whole goal is to understand situations so you understand the vocabulary used in those situations, and that's when you speak fluently. Okay? All right. Let's go back and see if anybody else had any more. Let's see here. Rip, 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 rip. So I'm worried about your actual situation. Yeah, so I understand the way you're speaking, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Glad to hear it. Bruce says English is composed of many languages within. Yes, so English, yes, there are actually different languages and continuing uh, to pull languages into English. There's actually some Japanese in English as well, like the word tsunami. Uh, I'm worried about being uh, unable to finish my work today. Yep, so again, you're worried about something. You will more frequently hear worried about something, so if you're thinking about it. But again, the point is not to just think we always use about if we say worried. It could be, I could be using a different situation. So the native speaker, it doesn't matter where they're born, it just is how they learn the language. So a native speaker is not born, a native speaker is made, and that's why you can become a fluent speaker too. All right, warm regards uh, from Colombia. Says Olga, nice to see you there. So we are thankful to you improving our English level. Yep, it's my pleasure. All right, so I'm worried for my friend who is going through a difficult time. Yep, excellent. So in that case, you could say I'm worried for. I could also say I'm worried about. It just the, the slight nuance is that am I thinking about him or am I trying to imagine myself in his situation? All right. So usually it's like a higher level of worry. I'm really worried for my friend who's going through a, a tough time in his company or his life or something like that. Xavier says, "Can I we're worried for you about the situation? Yep, you could say that too. Very good. So if you want to make it more complicated, so I'm worried for you about your situation. You could say that as well. So I'm worried for my daughter about her getting into the right college or something. All right, so I'm worried about that person, uh, but where I could be worried for them about a particular situation. Uh, let's see, I'm worried about the upcoming job interview. Yes, and, uh, and it is. I don't know what that means. All right, uh, let's see if I got all those. All right, Martin says, hey, I'm learning French, and what should I do as I am a beginner? Well, the same way you would learn uh, a language anyway as a beginner, and that's to get lots of input, that the same 
like little kids are getting. So when little kids are, are learning a language, they have to learn that language all in their native language. There is no other way to teach them because you can't use translations. They can't read or write yet. So the only thing you can do is like make the language understandable. It's just tricky to, to learn a language as an adult that way because nobody makes lessons for that content. You can see how to do this in English like we have for Frederick. So that's the app where we do this uh, for people learning English in English. Uh, and we also have a video series, The I think it's called The Best Beginning Grammar Playlist. But if you, if you go to my channel and watch that video series, you'll see how to do that. That's the kind of way you should be learning French. Uh, but if you're a polyglot, says you're a polyglot there, then you probably have done that already a couple of times. But I would look for maybe like shows for French kids, or it's just something like very simple, basic stuff for, for French kids that really help them understand that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so stuff for beginners. But I would, I would really recommend watching stuff, so YouTube would be helpful for that. Fatima is asking if I can share the video or, or save the video. Yes, I will do that. Uh, I always save these live videos. Let's see how much time we do. We're okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, a. Monir says, hello, I'm an English teacher and I want to work with you. Is this available? What do you mean work with me? So all the content we have, anybody is certainly free to use that information. Uh, and hopefully more people will begin teaching like the native way. So English as a first language rather than English as a second language. All right, Olga says, for about people, I can use it when is any situation. For about people, I can use about when is any situation. I think you mean, can you always use about? Yes, if you're just talking generally about someone where you could be worried about something, it just means what, it, what is the subject of your thinking? What are you thinking about? All right, so I'm thinking about my work, I'm thinking about my wife, I'm thinking about my dog, I'm thinking about something. And I could be worried about all of those things too. So it's not just a person, it's just what is the subject. So I'm worried about my car. There's a, there's a weird sound on my car, so I'm worried about my car, all right? I wouldn't really be worried for my car. <laughs> So that would sound funny. I'm kind of worried for my car. It means like the car has emotions and I'm, I'm being like empathetic with the car. So that sounds kind of funny. Again, this is why we want naturally varied review where we get lots of different examples of things that really help you understand that. All right. So hopefully it's more clear now. So if you're worried about something, it's just a subject of your thinking. But if you're worried for it, it you really kind of put yourself in that person's place to try to understand what's going on with them or how they're feeling. So I wouldn't really be able to do that with a car, but I can certainly worry about my car. I'm thinking about it. Oh no, there's a problem with my car. I'm worried about my car, all right? Uh, let's see. So Swerty, I'm from Morocco. I hope everyone is learning well. Nice to see you there. All right. This case is worrying for us. Yep. So again, it could be worrying for you as well. Like there could be a problem with something like we don't really know what to do. Like it's causing us worry. It's worrying for us. Good example. All right. Hello. I want to be, uh, I think answered that one already. Happy Mother's Day. Yes, that's right. It's still Mother's Day. I think back in, uh, in Japan, it is not. That was yesterday. We had some nice cake. Uh, at the house yesterday for Mother's Day. Hello, Drew. Thanks for the tip to read children's books from other videos. Yep, I'm glad you liked it. Uh, that's just one way. The point is to, to look at the examples that we get from kids' books. Uh, and often the, the most popular kid stuff is just, it's just one idea that they repeat over and over and over again in the book. <laughs> So kids really enjoy learning that way. The whole point is because it feels good for them to understand more each time. So when they read something, they're like, ah, I, I got it. The kids love that feeling of understanding something. That's why they like that kind of book. Uh, but I'm always recommending we should be learning the same way. Um, okay, let's see. Pablo from Australia. Nice to see you there. Bruce again. Why? Uh, you mean, ah, uh, and, ah, uh, like in Spanish. Ah, uh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, and San is three. Yep, that's correct. Is there a scientific proof that your method works? Yep, it's the way you got fluent in your native language. 
That's, the, that's all the proof you need. I mean, there are studies as well. Dr. Stephen Krashen is one example. Uh, there was another study in Japan. If you go to my site, you can find, what's the, well, I think it was the, like the five different language learning methods. You'll see an article about that. Like go to englishanyone.com, click on free uh, articles or free blog posts or like it's like free lessons and look for that article. It's one, one near the top. But it's, there's a link to a study in that one, too, that confirmed the same thing. There's, there's really only one way we all get fluent in any language, uh, and I have not been shown a better way to do it. So until I'm shown a better way to do it, th this will be the way I learn. Uh, so this worked for me, this works for my students, and this works for everybody. It continues to work for you also in your native language. So let's say you hear a new word in whatever your language is. So maybe your language is like Swahili or French or Thai or you know whatever the language is. You will learn new vocabulary in your native language. And if you only hear it one time or you don't really understand that vocabulary, then you probably won't remember that word. But if you hear it again and again and in different ways from different people, it will make that very memorable for you and you will feel confident about using it. Okay? Um, so there, like, there really isn't, I, I'd actually like to see proof that the traditional method works for other people. <laughs> I'd like to see that proof. So like, show me two people, one of them is learning as a native and the other is learning as a student. Uh, that the student would get faster or get fluent faster than the native. Um, I don't imagine that would be possible. But this is why so many people continue to learn languages the traditional way but did not become fluent speakers. So they're learning English as a second language. They're learning the language like this, trying to memorize vocabulary rather than understand vocabulary from situations. Okay, so just remember, oh, like this is the way I got fluent in my native language. So yes, you were speaking as well, but like the speaking came after lots of understanding. So after you really felt confident about something, that's when you really started to feel fluent and, and had the confidence to express yourself. All right. Uh, so two out of three parties. I'm worried about my car. That doesn't work, it's okay. <laughs> So we are thinking of moving in three, yeah, so you'd be thinking of something that's correct. So I have compiled a list of 1,000 phrasal verbs on a sheet, and I plan to create a lotto game that associates each phrasal verb with a picture. Do you think this would be an effective learning strategy? Uh, no. You can try it. Maybe that will work for you, but I'm not interested usually in, in something that like could work for only one person who's very, very diligent and could study a lot and could spend time memorizing things like that. Just watch the video we have on the visual guide to phrasal verbs. If you go to our channel, um, look for, well, any, I've done a few phrasal verb videos, but they're all the same way. So it's all helping you understand first, like the kind of core verb of something. Like imagine like we like cut something. I want to give you many different examples of how we might like cut off a conversation. So I'm, I'm, that's a, a, an example of a phrasal verb. I might give you a bunch of like to cut through something. So maybe we're talking, we're not having a very clear conversation. I want to cut through all of this stuff that's not making sense and just get straight to the point. So here I'm using two different examples of this, but usually the phrasal verb begins with a physical thing, the physical idea it comes from, and then we move up to something more, um, more figurative. Uh, I've done that in a couple of different videos, but watch that series. Um, so we have a whole program about this and then the same thing in Fluent for Life. So all of the videos that we have in there, they're, they're trying to help you learn the same way. So we begin with situations. And again, this is why young kids are learning phrasal verbs and they learn them very quickly because they're all almost all visual. It's easy to understand them by seeing them rather than in a list uh, on a piece of paper. All right. So you can try that method. If it works for you, great. But I, would, uh, I wouldn't recommend people do that as like a lesson because I wouldn't do that either. All right. Um, so I'm Brazilian. Let's see. Learning as a child is the best way to learn, the best way to learn. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the point is it's not even like it's still the same way adults learn their native language. They're still just getting new information all the time. Uh, and if they understand it, then they can use it. If they don't understand something, then they don't feel very confident talking about that. 
So I mean, work as an online English teacher with you if you need teachers following your technique, a lesson plan, or guidelines. Uh, we might have a, like in the future, maybe um, we'll see. I don't know. We'll, we'll see about that. We, we don't currently hire teachers or anything like that, but you can certainly follow our advice uh, and, and use these with, uh, with the students that you teach. Uh, if I understand what they say but can't talk with them, how can I solve this problem, please? Uh, if you if you watch the the video I did a maybe what was that a few months ago, this is talking about the three levels of understanding. So watch that video and it explains why you understand maybe a little bit, but you don't understand well enough to use that um, to use that uh, vocabulary in a real conversation. So there are different levels of understanding, and this is why you can hear and understand natives, but you might not be able to use that vocabulary fluently. So watch that, watch that video. Uh, it's, I, I forget the name of it. It's like the three, uh, three levels of understanding or something like that, but you'll, you'll see that in the thumbnail. From my experiences learning from Andrew is I'm not only really focusing on the new words, but he says things as a native speaker says and helps me improve in my speaking ability. He is the best. All right. Yeah. So very good. Uh, I'm glad I'm helping you. And, and you made a very good point that, yes, the, the English lesson, especially the things that you see online or like in our programs, it's not just about the target vocabulary. You can hear me hear lots of examples of how I make sentences. And so again, when you understand the situation, what am I doing? What am I talking about? Why am I explaining it this way? If you think kind of bigger picture about what I'm doing when I'm teaching, that will build your understanding for situations so you can use those same like ways of speaking or sense, sentence structures in your situation or your conversations. All right. I think we got a little bit of time left. All right. I think, wait a minute, did I don't know if, oh, okay. So babies learn to speak backwards. Yeah, you could, you could say it like that. They're basically like learning the situation first. Oksana says, what if I need to list several actions? Uh, in other words, uh, anxious and give more assistance to my relatives. Is it correct? So I am anxious and give more assistance to my relatives. Is it correct? Hmm. I don't quite understand what you're trying to say. You mean you're like you're anxious about them? Like you're anxious about your relatives? You have a problem with your relatives or they have a problem? Uh, but yeah, tell me more if you need me to correct that. I'm worried for my daughter about her future. That, there you go. How many words should I understand a video to watch it? I'd, I'd say about 80 to 90%. You can feel that, and it, it's not just for videos. It's for reading or listening to anything. So if you don't understand anything at all, like if I listen to a video about people talking about, I don't know, some topic that I like, biology that I don't know, like a scientific thing that I don't know anything about, it will be very tricky for me. I'll have to learn all that definitions, all, all the vocabulary. Um, but you should be feeling that. Like if you can understand new vocabulary, what I usually do with these lessons is I try to make them about like 90% understandable so that if I'm teaching you something new, you can learn it all in English. All right, so that's how I'm trying to help you build your fluency, even if you don't speak. So if I can teach you well, I can begin with what you know and teach you new things. And because you learn something new in English, you feel much more confident about that. Uh, so that will help you use it confidently. All right, let's see. Oh, I like your pronunciation. I'm from China. Glad to hear it. And your voice. Keep doing good work. Why means path. Does maybe is that in Chinese or something? Uh, first time I caught you live. Yep, Akash, nice to see you there. Pronounce way. Huh. Do we translate the everything in our mother tongue in learning English? No, you shouldn't be translating anything at all. That's the whole point of this video. So if you're learning English as a second language, that means you're learning it through a different language. So you're learning it through your first language. What you should be doing is learning it all in English as a first language. So this is why I tell people learn English as a first language, not as a second language. Okay. So this is what we do in Frederick uh, or Fluent for Life. You can learn about those in the links down below this video. Uh, but even if you're doing this by yourself, this is how you should be doing it. But the, this video specifically is about, it's like examples of situations 
where we begin with a native speaker explaining how they might think about this. So if I ask a, a, a native speaker, give me a sentence with the word married in it, they might say married to or married for or married something else. All right? Like I might be married until I die. Okay? So again, it's, it's just an, another example of that thing because natives are beginning with a situation, not the vocabulary. The vocabulary doesn't mean anything by itself. It's only within, only in some kind of situation. Okay, so don't spend your time trying to learn all this vocabulary. You should be just hearing what people are saying in those situations because they might be married to, married for, married until, married something else. Okay, don't try to memorize the vocabulary. All right, you are the best teacher. I love you. Well, glad to hear it. Look at that, a big heart right there. I am thankful to her for marrying, marrying me. You would just say to marry me. You don't say marry to someone, but very good. All right, thanks a lot. I am learning English by playing an online game, World of Warcraft. <laughs> nice. All right, uh, Tuan, hello from Vietnam. How to understand random questions quickly. Teacher, again, you have to build up that understanding. If you go to my... Uh, there's another video I made recently that's how to speak fluently about almost anything and that will it takes you through this kind of process but for vocabulary so you should be prepared if you're learning the native way so if you're understanding vocabulary like a native then you will be prepared even for for random questions that maybe you don't know because you can respond in different ways Natives know there are many different ways to use something, so I might know this word married, but I know how to use it in different ways uh, to actually have fluent communication. All right? See if anyone else is here. Dip thongs are fun. Yes, I like thongs too. Thongs are good too. All right, I have a problem with speaking English. I often use uh, the wrong grammar. How to fix that? This is how you fix it. So again, the learning English the wrong way means that you're focusing on like the grammar point or some vocabulary or something like that, not focusing on the situation. So this is why we begin with the situation. What happens when someone is thankful? So look at that person over there. Like I'm watching a movie or a video or something and one person is like being so thankful to somebody else. They're thankful to someone else. Okay, thankful to someone else. All right, or I could be thankful for something, like I get a present, I'm thankful for this marker. I could even say, thanks to this marker, I'm able to write, okay? So there are different ways, and even I could express the same thing using different, uh, like different words, like two or four. But you get to this point when you start here. You don't start here, this is the wrong way to learn. The right way to learn is beginning with the situation, all right? So don't start with, like uh, usually people have a thing they want to say in their native language and then they, they translate that or think about, okay, like the word, let's say I want to say like in Japanese, like ni. So this is like, I could say, oh, ni equals like two or whatever. But that's not always, that's not always, a tr always the same thing. Like, so ni doesn't mean to. And I don't want to think about the vocabulary that way. I want to think about when do we use that? All right. When do we use that? Now, a lot of times it might be to, but maybe it's not. Okay? So the important thing is beginning with the situation. When do we do something? When do we do it? Why do we do that? All right? And then you get the vocabulary for that thing naturally. All right? That's how you should be building your understanding of words. All right. The chat GPT is capable of generating various scenarios based on a given word when prompted to do so. Yes, that's correct. Uh, let's see. Hello. Uh, one time in live. That's correct. Shirley, thanks. Uh, one, I'm asking him for help because it's kind of a diff uh, different way of teaching and it needs some help or supervision to get the same outcomes. Two, I want to work with him. Ah, yeah. So if you're watch those videos that I that I made. Uh, so if you're you're asking about like how to teach this way, so yes, it requires like a teacher or some kind of input. Number one, that's understandable, and if if it's like too complicated, uh, then you won't like, it like ruins the whole process, and that's why you need to translate. So most of the most of the content um, that people get is not understandable. That's why there are translations in the lessons. So if you look at a textbook. It's giving you a whole bunch of English. Like, I mean, imagine when I was a classroom English teacher here in Japan.
So the first word in or the first sentence, I mean, it was like the whole thing like, uh, like this is a pen. Okay. Now imagine you don't know any English at all. It's like, this is a pen. Look at all that. You've got uh, pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary. We have a sentence structure here. We don't know what any of these words mean. So if you imagine you are a child seeing this, it's like, what are these? I mean, it might as well be like, you know, crazy alien language. So if you're, if you're, if you're thinking about the child learning the language, it looks like this. It looks even worse than my handwriting. <laughs> All right. So, but this is when you're you're learning something and you and it's all new. It's like, okay, is this a word, or is this a word? I don't know. What does this mean? Is this is this a word? People don't know. All right. So, of course, you need to have translations for this because people don't understand what you're talking about. But if I begin with marker, marker, marker. Now I've given you something, okay, what's the same with all of these things here? Marker, marker, marker. Ah, now I get it. He's talking about this object. So even though the color is different, it's the same thing. Now I could mean maybe long or something else like that, but I could also show you other examples, maybe like a, a slightly, slightly different one. So marker, uh, let's see. Not a marker, not a marker. Okay, so marker, not a marker. So I could show you different examples of other things that you write with. Like here's a, here's a pen with a string on it. So pen, pen, marker, okay? So if I'm teaching you the language all in English, I really want to make it understandable so I don't need the translations. If you need the translations, the student doesn't understand what you're saying. So watch that series of videos I have, uh, the Best Beginning English Grammar Playlist. The first video in that series is just I, eyes, ear, ears. Because I'm trying to teach you, ah, oh, okay, like in English we have, you know, like a singular, one I, and plural. But without teaching you, okay, here's the word singular and plural, and maybe you don't know those things in, uh, in your native language, but you understand it in English. So in Japanese, we don't say like, there isn't like I, Z in Japanese. It doesn't work that way. So you learn that same thing in Japanese. It's like me, me. So I can count those if I want to, but I'm just talking about two things. And it works differently in English. But the point is I'm learning it like a native. Okay, so there's nothing stopping me from translating or hesitating or anything like that. I'm just slowly starting to understand the language. And as I understand, then I feel certain. And that's when I speak. All right. So most people are not in, a, in they don't feel certain about what they know. They worried, okay, is it thankful to or thankful for? Ah, it means you're not certain about the language. And that's why you struggle to speak. Okay but not because you did anything wrong. It's just, this is the way most people teach. Most people are teaching the language as a second language rather than a first language, all right? Hopefully all this makes sense. Very, very important. <laughs> so if you understand this, then you will, you will become a fluent speaker. So we don't, we don't have like training for teachers about this, but if you watch, there is a video I made about how to teach English as a first language recently. So I made that uh, maybe a month or two ago. You can watch that as well to learn more specifically about this. But it's all basically the same idea. Think about how you would teach somebody new, like teach an adult some new thing in, uh, in your native language. You have to make it understandable for them. You can't use a different language to teach that. All right, I always miss the live. Thank God for notification. <laughs> this is dimple. Well, again, even if people don't, uh, don't get the live, uh, I save all these on the YouTube channel so people can watch them. All right, it's a great structured learning system. Yeah, you're a really amazing teacher. Glad to hear it. Now, remember, I'm not doing anything different than any parent does to teach their own kids. I mean, I'm a bit more structured about how I do it, but I'm really just doing that. I'm making it understandable so you can, so you can really understand the language, all right? When you understand, you speak. So you don't I, don't, I don't try to get you to repeat these things. This is why we don't start with words and I say, okay, class, repeat after me, two, four, two, four, four, about. That would be a horrible lesson because it's not helping you understand anything. <laughs> 
But if I begin with just one example, like, okay, let's talk about being thankful. And I give you a bunch of examples about people being thankful to someone else. Oh, thank you. I, like, I'm, I'm so thankful to you. I'm thankful to you for giving me these markers. So I could be thankful for these things. Like if I get a present, oh, thank you for doing that for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Bruce again says, one reason for it being harder for non-native speakers is the structure of the left, right versus right, left. Some languages start from the left and then jump in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are, there are like differences like that about how the language might be structured or like in Japanese, the verb is at the end of the sentence. But my point is, it doesn't make sense to try to tell a student to try to diagram a sentence like that because that's not going to mean anything to them. If I say, hey class, uh, this is our first lesson, a Japanese sentence is like this. We begin with a noun and then we end with a verb, which is different from English. Now, a much better lesson is like actually just making that clear in Japanese, okay? So I don't want to, I don't want to translate, I don't want to give you any explanations about like linguistic stuff or names of grammar points that you don't even know in your native language. Now, people who study languages, they probably learn things like, Ooh, what is the past simple or whatever, uh, but most natives do not know that information, okay? So if I'm trying to teach you the language, like if I'm teaching you Japanese, it's the same thing, like maka, 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 maka. I'll give you a quick quiz. Kuroi maka, kuro, aka, akai maka, aka, akai maka, kuro, kuroi maka. Ao, ao i maka, aka, ao, kudo, kudo, ne? Okay. So some people, uh, yes, if you just like learning different languages, you will learn all that stuff. But you could actually become uh, a fluent speaker much faster if you're just trying to learn and understand like a native. So if I was trying to learn a bunch of new languages, I would still need. Um, like, you know, somebody who's, who's able to make it clear for me. I can do it by myself. It's possible to do, and that's how I got fluent in Japanese. But it's much faster, as you can see, when you have someone that can help you understand it. So, yes, correct. Ao, blue. Okay. Aka, red. All right. But the point is, I don't want to, like, teach you the language. So let me see if I have anything else. So the same thing over here. The point is to, is to bring you to a higher level or a deeper level of understanding. If I just say kudo, if that's the only Japanese you heard, kudo, you don't really know what I mean. I know what I mean as a teacher, but you don't. You can guess, am I talking about the color, the shape, the thing? What am I talking about? Maka, ha, kudo, 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 ao, ao. Ao, ao, aoi maka, aoi jishaku, 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 aoi maka, aoi jishaku, aka, akai, akai maka, akai jishaku, wakatta, you got it, okay? So as I give you more examples, I'm, I'm basically building a web in your mind that helps you understand things. And if I could continue to do that every day, you would start speaking Japanese. Pretty easy, all right? This is the same way kids are getting fluent. Again, like the proof is right here. And it's the same thing you're doing every day as you learn your native language. All right, let's see how much time. Whoa, I gotta shut it down. Shut it down pretty soon. All right, so the best way, if someone else is asking, Mom is asking about phrasal verbs. Uh, and again, go, if, you, if you're if you interested in learning more about that, so we have the visual guide to phrasal verbs is included in Fluent for Life. Uh, and you can also find more examples of specific phrasal verb, specific phrasal verb videos right on our channel. So just search them on English Anyone here on YouTube. All right, uh, Mayor says, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, greetings from Armenia. You're a great teacher. Glad to hear it. All right, let's see. So here's one, Liu in Chinese, the six pronounce. Yeah, so again, like trying to, trying to teach that 
like the like something like Chinese through text would be basically impossible. <laughs> so you need to hear the different examples of that. Um, but again, that's how you do it. Oh, TJS is please don't talk about another language. You'd say please don't talk about other languages. But I'm giving you an example in Japanese because it's making you clear. It's reminding you of how you got fluent in your native language. So sometimes I give Japanese examples. All right. Good job, teach. That's right. It's basically revised Mandarin. All right. Very good. Well, and hiragana, hiragana and katakana are very good. All right. All right. Well, hopefully everybody understands that. Remember, to learn the language the wrong way means you're just beginning with vocabulary, which doesn't mean anything by itself. Okay? Even a noun, like the word, uh, I don't know, what's a good example? Like night. All right? So if I just say the word knight and ask you, like, what does that mean? It could be like a knight, like a knight with a sword and shield, or I could be talking about day and night. All right? So vocabulary very, very rarely means anything by itself. And this is why it's really difficult for, uh, like, for AI or translating things to, to communicate the same way a native does, because natives have a different understanding of vocabulary that's connected to situations. It's not about the vocabulary by itself. Okay? Yeah. So yes. So you know you know how to say kudo. 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 So if I'm if I'm teaching you like kudo. Kudo. All right. See if I remember my kanji over here. Kudo. So this is the Chinese character for that. Kudo. Uh, and the hiragana. Kudo. All right. So if you understand uh, this lesson, always be looking for situations. Watch what natives do. See, like, okay, they're in this situation in a movie or in real life. What are they saying? What are they doing in that situation? And that's when you're going to understand uh, understand much better, and you will feel like, uh, like, wow, I really understood what they said, all in English, and now I feel confident about using it. All right. So don't begin with the vocabulary. That's the wrong way to do it. The right way is to understand like a native, and that's what's going to help you speak. All right, I think we're all good over here. All right, yes, I think we got everybody. All right, well, thank you all. So thanks to you. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure uh, even doing this quick video, even though we've been talking, what are we going? Well, almost an hour. But now I have to go and eat some lunch. I'm pretty hungry over here. But if you would like to continue learning with me, all of this, the stuff that I talk about on YouTube, uh, it's not really theory, it's, but it's trying to give practical examples for people that want to learn how to learn. Uh, so you can do that by yourself. Or if you'd like someone just to do everything for you and just give you all the input and, and basically get you fluent without you saying anything, this is what we do in Fluent for Life. So if you'd like to learn more about that, you can click on the link in the description, and you can do the same thing with Frederick as well if you're a beginner. I say good night and thank you so much. Yes, Niels, enjoy uh, your evening in Wisconsin. Hopefully the weather is getting warmer over there. And everyone else, enjoy your day. Bye-bye.